I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth. I just had a conversation with somebody that made me think that this would be a good presentation to present. So <clears throat> I'm hoping that this will be very educational as what I did while I was in Australia was I found that a lot of people were asking this question. And so I found a whole list of Bible verses. And I also found a whole list of spirit prophecy quotes which would go through that same concept of answering this question. Who is the Holy Spirit? A very important question, don't you think? <clears throat> and so what we're going to do is look at the question through Bible verse, Ellen White quote. Ellen White quote, Bible verse. Bible verse, Ellen White quote. Ellen White quote, Bible verse. We're just going to go back and forth, back and forth to show that the same exact principles that we find in the Bible are found in the writings of Ellen White regarding the Holy Spirit. And we will also find that the same concepts found in Ellen White's writings are also found in the Bible. That goes back and forth. The Bible is extremely clear on this matter. And the more I study it, the more I realize that is the truth. Now, I also realize and understand that Sister White was um, very clear on this as well. The more I study the, Bi the writings of Ellen White, the more clear it is to me. And so it is a real blessing to be able to share with you guys the ideas that um, I believe the Lord led me to and has led you to as well. Many of you may have already studied this subject and you could probably give an answer right away. But repetition deepens impression, right? And as far as I'm concerned, a presentation like this that just goes back and forth with scripture and writings of Ellen White, back and forth, back and forth, should answer every single question. But I realize that doesn't happen every time. The reason being is, Sister White says that we have much to learn and much, much to unlearn. I'm still unlearning. We're going to realize how the Father and the Son work to and through us. Amen? And this is not even touching the angels yet. I know there was a comment about the angels, and maybe we'll go through that too, but this is dealing with just the concept of the Spirit and who the Spirit is. So let us pray, and then we're going to get into this message. I'm going to try to just get through it real quick so that if you have questions, we'll be able to answer those questions as well, hopefully. Father, I ask that you'd please continue to have mercy on us, being able to share with us the truths that are found in your holy word. I pray that we would not be left here alone, but rather that your spirit would be here. Thank you so much for what we're going to be learning today and sharing and understanding in regard to your spirit. I pray that you'd please give us an understanding in such a way from the Bible and from the concepts found in the writings of Sister White, that we will be able to show from the Bible what it does say and what it doesn't say. I pray that you wouldn't trust me with any words here, but rather may we hear the voice of your Son through his Spirit. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. A very good question. Who is the Holy Spirit? Now, what it is not asking, clarification, I am not asking, what is the Holy Spirit? Because we have been told, and you will hear this a thousand times. In fact, I'll just read it with you. You will be able to hear this concept where it says, Acts of the Apostles, page 51. The nature of the Holy Spirit is a mystery, Sister White says, right? Men cannot explain it because the Lord has not revealed it to them. Men have fanciful views, and they may bring together passages of Scripture and put a human construction on them, but 
the acceptance of these views will not strengthen the church regarding such mysteries which are too deep for understanding. What does she say? Silence, Silence is golden. I'll tell you, I have heard that phrase a thousand times, mostly from people who don't understand the subject. Because they read this part, they stopped right there, and they said, that's it, I'm not talking more about it. Now, this was a very difficult quote for me when I first started studying this idea too. In fact, I sent it to my friends and said, hey guys, we need to back off a bit, because that's what she says. But what she's talking about is, what's the second word of the paragraph? The nature of the Holy Spirit. I don't know how to explain the nature of the Holy Spirit, because I believe the Holy Spirit is omnipresent. I did a recent presentation. In fact, it's one I was told, I was saying that I would do again, probably in Kenya. So I might even do it here while I'm with you all. It's called Omnipresence Proceeding. I was able to find from the Bible the ideas of omnipresence. And I was able to go through and show what I felt like a fairly decent understanding of omnipresence. Now, one thing I cannot explain is what omnipresence is. And that's why I cannot explain the nature of the Holy Spirit. How do I understand the nature of something if I have nothing to do with it, right? It's pretty difficult. You know, you, some young men might think and some young women might think that it's really easy to have children. And then when you have children, you realize, wow, it's really difficult to have children. But you didn't know that because you hadn't experienced it. So how can I explain omnipresence if I'm not omnipresent? You with me? So yes, the nature of the Holy Spirit is a mystery, but she does not say who the Holy Spirit is, is a mystery. She's very clear on that one. So let's go and understand a little bit more here. Okay, first, Scripture. I and my Father are two. Is that what it says? It says one. I and my Father are one, but it's interesting because they are two, right? Notice what it says. Yet they were two. Yet little short of being identical. Two in individuality, yet one in spirit. Wow, what does that mean? I and my father are one. He didn't say I and my father are two. But it's true, they are two. But it's also true they are one. How are they one? They're one in spirit. That's a youth instructor, December 16th. So pardon me, I'm sorry, I don't know how to move out of the way of everybody. So I'm going to stay right here. If you need to move that, go for it. <clears throat> so what's interesting is that we can understand that there is one spirit. And that's according to Ephesians 4. I don't even know if I use that in this study or not. So what I'm going to do is go to Ephesians 4, and I think it's verse 6. Nope, it's above that. Yeah, here we go. We're to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body, and how many spirits? One spirit. One spirit. Even as you are called in the hope of your calling, there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, which is Father of all, including Christ, who is above all, through all, and in you all. So the Father is above all. He does everything through His Son, which is um, through all, and then He's in the Spirit, in you all. By the way, Christ is not in sinners. The Bible makes that clear. The Holy Spirit is given to those who obey Him. Right? If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and He shall send you another comforter. If you don't love me, you won't keep the commandments, and I won't pray that the Father will send you a comforter. You see how that works? The, the Holy Spirit is not in the sinner. The Holy Spirit is in those who are willing to follow Christ. Why? Because that's how we enter into the same Holy Spirit. Now, you know what's interesting is the Father, the Son, and all the angels were part of one Holy Spirit. There was only one Spirit in heaven. Everybody had it. Everybody had that same happy Holy Spirit. But then there was this angel, and this angel ended up with an unholy spirit. Now there are two spirits in the universe. You with me? Now, everybody has their own individual personality. All the angels had their own personality. The Father has his own personality, and the Son has his own personality. And individually, they have their own spirit. But that's not the Holy Spirit that was, uh, how would you say, overall and in them all. But when Lucifer came into existence, there was an unholy spirit. 
And then a third of the angels decided to partake of his unholy spirit. Now there's two spirits in the universe. And so what's going to happen is those that follow the enemy end up with his unholy spirit, whereas those that follow the Lord end up with his Holy Spirit. Does that make sense? Yes. So yes, but no, because there's so many questions about it, right? How can I have a spirit, but not be part of God's spirit, and yet be part of the devil's spirit, but I don't have, you know, there's so many ways to think about it, but the spirit is more, in my study anyways, more of a mindset. If we have committed our minds to follow God, we have committed ourselves to enter into his holy mindset. God follows his law, correct? Does he have the Holy Spirit? The Son follows his Father's law, correct? Does he have the Holy Spirit? The good angels follow his Father's law, and they too have the Holy Spirit. Lucifer chose not to follow the Father's law. Did he have the Holy Spirit? No. So the Holy Spirit is given to those that obey him. That's the mindset. I want to follow God. I am going to receive the Holy Spirit. Okay, that's the concept. Now, go back to our study here. They were two, yet one in spirit. Very important to understand. John 3, 34. Whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God, for God giveth not the spirit by measure unto him. And then Sister White just makes it clear. The Father gave whose spirit? His spirit without measure to his son. Interesting, right? So it's the Father's Spirit that was given to the Son. Now, it's interesting because we, as humans, that have chosen to sin, we cannot get the Father's Spirit. Why? Because there's only one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Not the Son of God, but the man. Christ Jesus. And so when Christ came here on this earth, and like it says in Christ's Object Lessons, I believe it's page 311, it says that Christ was here and he was working out a robe of righteousness which was not woven with one single thread of human devising. So it was all about the Father, the Father's righteousness. He was working that out. And as a result of working that out, as a human, he was able to have a, when you look it up, it's actually like a, a woving, a weaving together of his human spirit and the divine spirit. And so now it became part of Christ's spirit. He had been sealed with that spirit he was loyal to his entire life. And now that he's a human, Christ is able to give the Father's Spirit, which is now His because He committed to it 100%, He's able to give that Spirit to you. And so that's how we cannot receive the Father's Spirit without Christ's mediation. Does that make sense? There's a whole lot more to that. That was a very brief explanation. But the Father gave His Spirit without measure to His Son. Now, if His Father gave His Spirit without measure to us, what would happen to us? We would cease to exist. Because there's only one mediator between God and men. If there's no mediator, then we are exploded, right? Consumed by the brightness of his coming. We know that's the son's coming, but the son comes in the glory of the father and the angels. Notice what it says. In giving us his spirit, God gives us himself. How? All things are of God and by his son. So in giving us his spirit, God's spirit, he gives of himself, but he gives us through his son because there's only one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. By the way, that's 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. So 2 Corinthians 5, 19, God was where? In Christ, in Christ reconciling the world to himself. And so that's how God gave himself because he was in Christ. Notice what it says, John 15, verse 26. When the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceeds from the Father, he shall testify of me. 
So the Bible says right here that I will send unto you the Comforter from the Father. So where does the Comforter come from? From the Father through the Son, right? Notice it says, even the Spirit of truth. Who is the truth? John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by the third being in the Trinity called the Holy Spirit. Is that what it says? No. No man comes unto the Father but by me, Jesus said. And so if you want to get to the Father, you're not getting there through the Holy Spirit, which is not Jesus. You're getting through there to him through the Spirit, which is Jesus. You with me? So notice what it says here, though. It proceeds from the Father. The Spirit proceeds from the Father. That means the Father has an omnipresent Spirit. The Holy Spirit, which proceeds from the only begotten Son of God, is what Ellen White says. Well, wait a minute. I thought the Bible said that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. But it does, right? Because Christ says, I will send you the Comforter from my Father. So it proceeds from the Father to the Son, and from the Son it proceeds to you. That's why Christ, in John chapter 20, verse 22, was able to say, he breathed on the disciples, and he said what? Receive ye the Holy Ghost. So there, in the Bible, you can see the concept or the principle of Christ having the Holy Spirit proceed from him, given to his disciples. So far, we're consistent with the Bible in Ellen White. He breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. That's John 20, verse 22. Galatians 4, 6. Because you are sons, God hath sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. We read this one earlier, but notice what it's saying. God has sent forth the spirit of who? His son. His son. <clears throat> so my friend, Dr. Davis, he asked me a question one time that was actually very helpful. He said, who did God send? I said, well, his son. He said, did he ever send anybody else? I said, no, well, I don't think so. And then he, he said, well, that's, that's what this means here. God didn't send anybody other than his son. So remember in verse 4 of Galatians 4, it says, in due time, God sent forth his son. Two verses later, it says, God hath sent forth the spirit of his son. So when we receive the spirit, who do we receive? Jesus, Jesus Christ. Now there is a quote, maybe I can try to find it. Let me see. Um... I think I can find it in a spiritual sense. None will keep the law of God unless they love him who is the only begotten of the Father. It's a pretty powerful statement. Nonetheless, surely, if they love him, they will express that love by steadfast, willing obedience. And all who love Christ will be loved of the Father, and he will manifest himself to them, in all their emergencies and perplexities, they will have a helper in God. So what we're reading here is this section where it says he will manifest himself to them. That is actually part of a quote from John chapter 14, verse 22. Okay? And uh, 23, really. Notice what's being said. It was difficult for the disciples to understand the words of Christ, that Christ should manifest himself to them, and yet be invisible to the world. It was a mystery to them. They could not understand the words of Christ in a spiritual sense. What section is that that we're talking about? Is the time where in John 14, 16, Jesus had said, I will pray the Father, and he shall send you another comforter. Okay, some people get caught up on that another comforter idea as though it's another of something entirely different. It's not. It's another of the same. Remember, God the Father is the God of all comfort, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3. And so what we have is Christ being sent, and then the Spirit of Christ being sent as another comforter, another of the same comforter. So it's in a spiritual sense that we're supposed to understand this visible um, 
I'm sorry, this invisible manifestation. For the disciples, they were thinking of an outward visible manifestation. They could not take in the fact that they could have the presence of who? Christ with them, and yet he be unseen by the world. They had yet to learn that the inward spiritual life, all fragrant with obedience and love, would give them the spiritual power they needed. So Ellen White quotes the indwelling of the spiritual life with spiritual power that we will all need. Notice as we continue here. So this is talking about sending the spirit of his son. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of Christ, which is sent to all men to give them sufficiency. Okay, just to make it clear, she just said the Holy Spirit is the spirit of Christ, right? That's amazing. And so if we're going to have victory on this earth in preparation for being the 144,000 that actually see the coming of the Messiah, well, not the Messiah, the, the Son of God, in the clouds of heaven, or the Son of Man, you could say, those people are going to have His Spirit because He's the one that overcame sin to begin with. Wouldn't it be, there was a question earlier that was asked, why is it important in an end time scenario that we understand who God is. Well, if you have the wrong God, you have the wrong righteousness. If you want to be very simple, that is an extremely important concept. If we have the Trinity God and we're claiming the Trinity's righteousness, what kind of righteousness will we get? False, False untrue, unreal, non-existent righteousness. But if we have the true Son of God that demonstrated to this world His Father's righteousness and we're claiming His righteousness, what do we get? The righteousness of God in Christ. So I think that's amazing and very important to understand. So the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ, which of course He had the Spirit of His Father, which was the union between the two. Notice what she says here. We want the Holy Spirit, which is Jesus Christ. That's pretty plain. If we commune with God, we shall have strength and grace and efficiency. Matthew 28, verse 20. Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world, Jesus said. Wait a minute. Who's with us always? Jesus Christ is with us always, even unto the end of the world. And so I think that's very important to understand. This was right after he said that we're to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And then he described who the Holy Ghost is. He said, I will be with you even into the end of the age, right? So that's important to understand is that Christ is the one who promised that. John 14, 23, we will come unto him and make our abode with him. That would be the father and the son come into those that love God and keep his words. And the father and the son will together make their abode in that person. That's a very good scripture. Now here's an Ellen White quote. By the Spirit, the Father and the Son will come and make their abode with you. Isn't that amazing? So, Sister White is completely consistent with what the Bible is teaching. And it is not teaching a trinity. It's teaching that the Father has given His Son. And through the Son, the Father has given His Spirit, which we could also call the Spirit of Christ. Ephesians 2.18 for through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. So Ellen White clarifies in Youth Instructor, we have access to God through the merits of the name of Christ. Remember Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. And God invites us to bring to him our trials and temptations, for he understands them all. How does he understand them all? Because his son went through those temptations and trials, right? So Christ had to become a human, according to the book of Hebrews, to be able to enter into our temptations and sufferings and therefore be able to succor those that need help or grace in time of need. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto me or unto the Father but by me. There are not many ways to heaven. Each one may not choose his own way. Christ says, I am the way, 
No man comes unto the Father but by me. Since the first gospel sermon was preached, when in Eden it was declared that the seed of the woman should bruise the serpent's head, Christ had been uplifted as the way, the truth, and the life. So she takes this all the way back to Genesis, the concept of Christ being the only way to the Father. Remember the vision that Jacob had? He was dreaming, and there was something that was touching the ground and touching heaven at the same time. Which was it? It was a ladder. You know what's interesting? Christ is the way that touched the earth, and Christ is the way that touches heaven. And what was ascending and descending upon that ladder? Angels. Angels? Yep, angels. Amazing. Yeah, put that one in your head. While Jesus ministers in the sanctuary above, he is still, right now, by his spirit, the minister of the church on earth. He is withdrawn from the eye of sense. In other words, you can't see him. But his parting promise is fulfilled. Lo, I am with you always, even into the end of the world. That's Matthew 28, 20. While Christ, or he, delegates his power to inferior ministers, his energizing presence, which is called the Holy Spirit, is still with his church. Desire of Ages 166. So Revelation 113, in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one was like unto the Son of Man. Who is the Son of Man? Jesus, and also Ezekiel, if you read that. He was clothed with a garment down to the foot and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. Wait a minute. In the midst of the seven candlesticks, what does the Bible say the candlesticks represent? The churches. Who's in the midst of the churches? Christ Jesus. And so Christ is the one who's in the midst of the churches. And for some reason, we have been led to, well, I know what reasons, but I'll just say it that way. For some reason, we have been led to, many of us believe in the past, that we're to have this third being that's not in the midst of the churches according to the Bible. John 14, verses 16 and 17. I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth. Remember, Christ is the truth. And the spirit of truth is what we're talking about. So the word of means that the truth possesses that spirit. If the truth is Jesus, then it's the spirit of Jesus, right? So even the spirit of Jesus, or even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive. Why? Because it doesn't see him, neither does it know him. But Jesus is speaking to the disciples, and he says, but you know him, because he currently dwells with you, and shall, future tense, be in you. So Christ is talking about himself as the comforter that is currently dwelling with them. And then he says, that spirit, my spirit, the spirit of truth, I will be in you. And then what's, I didn't include it here, but the very next verse says, I, Jesus is still speaking. He says, I will not leave you comfortless. So if he doesn't leave them comfortless, what does he leave them? Comforted. I will pray the Father and he will give you another comforter. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. And that's when Andrew is the one, I'm not Andrew, but Judas, not Iscariot. He's the one that says, how are you going to reveal yourself to us, but not to the world? And that's why I read that earlier about um, Sister White saying that the disciples were having a hard time understanding it in a spiritual sense. They thought he was going to physically manifest himself. How are you going to do that? Through my spirit. This refers to the omnipresence of the spirit of Christ called the comforter. So I, I showed these verses right here, John 14, 16, and 17. In the context of this next quote, which is the 14th manuscript release, Ellen White says this directly after quoting those verses. She says, this refers to the omnipresence of the spirit of Christ called the comforter. I think that's amazing. Because she says that the omnipresence of the Spirit of Christ. Now, whose Spirit did Christ partake of? The Father. So the Father's omnipresent Spirit through the Son is what comes to us, called the Comforter. 
There's only one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Let them study the 17th of John. In fact, she says elsewhere, let them study the 14th, 15th, and 16th of John and learn how to pray and how to live the prayer of Christ. He is the comforter. Did you hear that? Christ, he is the comforter. He will abide in their hearts, making their joy full. So according to the Bible so far, and according to Ellen White, who is the comforter? It's Christ Jesus. There's no way around it. It's not some third being. 1 John 2, verse 1. This word, advocate, it's interesting because that word, advocate, is the same identical word as the word comforter in John 14, 15, and 16. Let me explain this to you, and then I'll read this verse. There are only five times in all of the New Testament where the word parakletos is used. Parakletos is the word comforter. And four of those five times, so four of those five times, the word is translated comforter. One time it is translated advocate. Here is the verse where that word is translated advocate. And let's change it with the word comforter and see what name the Bible gives the comforter. My little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate or we have a comforter. What's the name? Jesus Christ, the righteous. So if you're to baptize in the names of God, the Father, his Son, and Jesus in the Spirit, you would baptize in the name of Jehovah, Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ. You with me? But really what that idea is, baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, what you're doing is you're entering into the family of God. God the Father has a Son. And that Son has given His Spirit, which we call the Comforter. And so when you're baptized in the name or character of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, you're baptized in the character of the family where God is the head of Christ, and Christ has given His Spirit. You see how that works? That verse is not difficult, and that verse does not explain the Trinity. That verse is simply referring to us entering into the family of God as adopted children. Okay? Jesus says in his prayer, one of the most sacred places on the earth, prayer time, this is life eternal, that they may know thee, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Notice what Sister White says. By faith we look to Jesus. Our faith pierces the shadow, and we adore God for his wondrous love in giving Jesus the comforter. So... There's, according to that previous verse, there's one God, one true God. Now, the word true, real quick, it doesn't mean that Christ is false. Okay, that's not what that means. What we're looking at is one original God. Like, for example, in Hebrews chapter 8, I think it's verse 2. In fact, let me just look at it real quick just to make sure. We have Hebrews 8 verse 2. It says, Jesus Christ is a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which obviously is the original tabernacle. You with me? So the sanctuary in heaven is the original sanctuary. Well, there's, a, there's one on the earth which is an express image of that sanctuary. Amen. Now, God the Father is the only original God. And there's an express image on this earth of that original God. So that's how we can call the Father the only true God. He's the only one that could give a son. See, if there wasn't the Father, there wouldn't be a son. Because the Father brought forth the Son. And Jesus Christ that he had sent into this world. So in giving Jesus... God gave the wondrous love in giving Jesus the comforter. Romans 8, verse 9. Notice what this says. You are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. In the spirit, not in one of the spirits. You are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be 
that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. There's one verse here that uses the term Spirit of God and Spirit of Christ synonymously. See how that works? There's one Spirit. You need to be partaker of that one Spirit, which is the Spirit of God and the Spirit of Christ. Because they had the same commitment, the same purpose, the same character. They were two, yet little short of, dif uh, little short of being identical. But they were one in purpose, one in character, one in what? Spirit. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Christ is to be known by the blessed name of Comforter. The Comforter, said Christ to his disciples, is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father which will, uh, will send in my name. He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. And that's from 1902. Quite late in the game, if you will. A lot of people will say, in fact, a lot of pastors a lot of leaders, a lot of conference brethren will say that Ellen White changed her tune into being Trinitarian after writing The Desire of Ages in 1898. But you can show quotes like this and many others that she did not change her tune at all. She knew who the third person of the Godhead, which she called it, was. It was the Spirit of Christ. And I'll sh I can show you later. I might include that verse or quote rather in this study later, but I can show you that there's a quote in manuscript, I think it's 44, where Sister White, she says, Christ wanted to try to figure out what kind of gift he could give to his disciples. So he was contemplating what gift could be equal to the place that, that I hold and be able to take the disciples and lift them up to that same place of being in heavenly places in Christ. And so he determined that he would give a gift. And this is the quote that I want to share with you. Christ gave his representative, the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. That's what she says. And then it says this gift could not be excelled. It was a donation that Christ would give. And so Christ gave part of himself, his spirit. Now, why, why is it a big deal that he gave his spirit? Well, he didn't have to give it. You see, when he was on the earth, there was a lot of antagonism against his spirit because he had the spirit of truth. Remember, he was with the disciples and that spirit will be, is with you now, but will be with you later, in you, rather it said, in John chapter 14, verse 17. When he decided to give a gift, do you think it would be hard if you were in his position? Having been so mistreated in this world, to decide to give your gift of your same peaceable, loving, gentle, kind, merciful spirit that will continually be mistreated and rejected and repulsed? Do you think you'd want to submit yourself to that? After you've already lived 33 years on this earth and have been treated like being crucified on the cross, spit upon, the beard pulled out, beat upon, rejected, etc.? I mean, you've already done that. You've already been there. You've already proved that you can live without sin in that scenario. Why would you want to give your spirit to be treated the same identical way? And so the gift of Christ's spirit is just as powerful as the gift of him coming. It's no less amazing that he would actually give the gift of his spirit to either be loved or mistreated. And most often we know it's mistreated. And so I think it's amazing that he's given the gift of his Holy Spirit. This is not something we should take lightly. The eighth manuscript, the Savior is our comforter. <laughs> Amen. Amen. This I have proved him to be. Amen. In fact, Sister White says something like, there is no comforter like Christ. Yes. So what is it again? So tender, so true. So... That's what she says. There is no comforter like Christ. Oh, wait a minute. 
<laughs> you mean the third person of the Trinity doesn't comfort quite the same way that Christ does? Not quite as good? No, that's what that means. There is no comforter like Christ, so tender, so true. This I have proved him to be. Jesus answered and said unto him, If any man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him. And we, my Father and I, will come unto him and make our abode with him. There is no comforter like Christ. Peace I leave with you, Jesus said. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world gives, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So who's the one leaving peace? It's Christ. There is no comforter like Christ, so tender and so true. There it is. I didn't remember I had that one. So the Holy Ghost, the third being of the, God, the Trinity, he doesn't comfort quite the same way. So Ellen White obviously knew that Christ was the comforter. Christ was the Holy Spirit. Christ is the one that comforts. He is touched with the feeling of our infirmities, like Hebrews says. His Spirit speaks to the heart. The influence of the Holy Spirit is the life of Christ in the soul. Did you hear what that said? Yes. The influence of the Holy Spirit is the life of Christ in the soul. The Holy Spirit is the mind that was sealed with perfect obedience displayed and experienced in the life of Christ while he was here on this earth. And that experience that he had is what he gives to you when you accept him as your savior. It's the Holy Spirit, which is the life of Christ in the soul. If he were to live on earth again, he would live the same identical way. And what's amazing is he does live on earth again through his spirit in people like you and people like me. That's how the, the Father and the Son make their abode in us. And they will continue to live out their life on this earth, being an example to those that do not know yet this life-changing truth. Jesus comes to you as the spirit of truth, the Bible says, or Sister White says. Study the mind of the spirit. Consult your Lord. Follow his way. So she's saying that the spirit of truth is your Lord asking you to follow his way. John 14, 16 through 17. We already read that, so I'm not going to again. But notice verse 13. When he, the spirit of truth, is come... He will guide you into all truth. So the spirit of truth, remember the word of makes, means it's possessive. So truth owns that spirit. It's the spirit of truth. Christ is the truth. So you could say it this way. When he, the spirit of Christ, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself. Now, this is a quote that sometimes people find it hard to understand. He doesn't speak of himself. That's why I included the next part there. I'll finish the verse first, and then we'll read the next part. But whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. There's the explanation, by the way. He will show you things to come. The word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me, Christ said. So now, as Christ is speaking the words of his Father, is he speaking of himself? No, he's speaking of his father's words. So now the Holy Spirit will not speak of himself. Why? Because he will show you the words of Christ. You can read that in other verses. He doesn't speak of himself, but what he shall hear, that's what he shall speak. So again, even as the spirit of Christ, he is still speaking the words of the father. While he was human, he did it. And in his spirit, he does it as well. Notice what it says. The spirit of truth is the only effectual teacher of divine truth. These who are taught of him, or those who are taught of him, have entered the school of who? Christ, because Christ is the spirit of truth. Or the spirit of truth is Christ's. Let me say that. How must God esteem the race that he gave his son to die for them and appoints his spirit to be man's teacher and continual guide? Again, that's in 1906. Quite a, quite a bit late. Christ was about to depart to his home in the heavenly courts, but he assured his disciples 
that he would send them another comforter who would abide with them forever. To the guidance of this comforter, all who believe in Christ may implicitly trust. He is the spirit of truth. By this truth, the world can neither discern nor receive. When the Comforter is come, whom I, Jesus said, will send for unto you from the Father, even my Spirit, the Spirit of truth, which proceeds from the Father, he shall testify of me. So here, what Christ is saying is that the Comforter that is him in spirit, he comes, but it's really the Spirit of the Father that comes through him. Why? Because there's only one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. I think that verse is so important to understand in this concept of us receiving the omnipresent spirit, the spirit of our Father. We cannot be with Christ in person, as were his first disciples. But he has sent his Holy Spirit to guide us into all truth. And through this power, which is the spirit, this power we too can bear witness for the Savior. And then she quotes John 16, 13, which we just read earlier. That was in 1900, by the way. Notice this verse, Mark 16. This is right at the end when Christ had just made an appeal for people to go and teach, baptizing them. And he says, those who are baptized will be saved. Those who are not baptized or won't surrender to Christ will be damned. He says this right after that. After the Lord had spoken unto them, he, the Lord, was received up into heaven. So now where's the Lord? In heaven. And he sat on the right hand of God, or at the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere. These are the disciples now. The Lord working with them, confirming the word with signs following. So when Christ was in heaven... Who was working with them? The Lord, the Christ, right? It's amazing. Now, remember we had just read earlier in early writings, I'm sorry, the book Education, when we looked at that quote that was dealing with an army of youth rightly trained, how was it that they were able to be worked? Through the angels, that's right. So that's very likely part of how the Lord is working with them. Now, you could, some people would say that because Christ is now human, he doesn't work with us down here through his spirit. He just sends his angels. I don't believe that because we're told, according to Sister White in John, chapter, or yeah, John 14, verses 16 and 17, she says, this refers to the omnipresence of the spirit of Christ called the comforter. Now, I believe the, the son has entered into his father's omnipresence. And so we can receive the Father's omnipresent spirit through the Son, as he is the one mediator. But what's fascinating is in the Old Testament, you can see that Christ came to minister on this earth as the angel of the Lord. But he had angels with him. Remember, for example, when Abram was there praying in Genesis chapter 18 and 19. Do you remember that Christ was there with them and Abram worshipped the Lord? But there was two angels with the Lord. Why were there two angels with the Lord? Well, I think part of the reason is because God wanted to show us that there were three angels that were sent to the world to pronounce destruction. The first angel, the second angel, and the third angel all gave their messages in order. And if you follow what, what happened there, you can see consistent, um, how would you say, activities that they went through just like our early church of the Seventh-day Adventists. When they went through the first, the second, and the third angels, it's all absolutely amazing. I presented that. I've got notes. If you're interested, just let me know. Oh, by the way, if you did want to um, find notes, I'm just going to write something here. This was a, a good suggestion earlier. phm.org. If you, whoops. If you go here, you can find a lot of notes of what I've presented, both the things that I'm sharing here, but also many other things. And you can just click the download notes button. It'll open up a PDF and then you can print that and have it for yourself to either study or to share with others. So phm.org, you'll go to the resources and under the resources, you'll find Bible studies or study notes, I think it's called. And then 
you'll actually find that there are a few of us that have written notes. You can click on my name if you'd like, and it leads you through. Right now, there's more than 70 different sets of notes that go through different topics of mostly who God is. So you can find that if you're interested. So the Lord was working with these disciples, very likely working not only like in the Old Testament with the Lord and two, two angels, but in the New Testament, I'm sure that the Lord comes through his spirit and he works with angels as well. Why? Well, let everything be done by the mouth of two or three witnesses, right? And so if Christ did everything alone, that would only be one witness. But if he does everything with angels, that would be in the mouth of two or three witnesses, wouldn't it? And so I think that principle even applies to the Father. Why? Because of the judgment. Think about it. If the enemy's in the judgment, he's condemned. He's going to be able to say, no, 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 wait a minute. All I had was angels. And we can verify that we did everything because we don't have omnipresence. We can't just show up in somebody's mind and like read their thoughts. In fact, it says that Sister White makes it clear the Bible, the enemy cannot read our thoughts. And so, what's going on here? If God worked only through his omnipresent spirit, he would have to say, well, you're just going to have to trust me, I'm God. But would that fly in the judgment? No, that wouldn't fly in the judgment. The enemy would say, that's not fair. But what God will be able to do is say, I have been able to minister through my omnipresent spirit, through the ministration of my son, and also we have witnesses for every single activity that occurred. And so the enemy will be silenced by the mouth of two or three witnesses. Amen? Amen. Amen. Desire of Ages. When he had said this, which I think uh, is referring to these, these verses here, Matthew 16. When he had said this, he, Christ, breathed on them. Oh, sorry, this is something else. And said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Before the disciples could fulfill their official duties in connection with the church, Christ breathed his spirit upon them. That's right there in the Desire of Ages. Jesus is waiting to breathe upon his disciples and give them the inspiration of his sanctifying spirit and transfuse the vital influence from himself to his people. Wow. So the influence that Christ had on this earth, he wants to transfuse to his disciples so that we can have that same influence that he had while he was on this earth. That's powerful. That's the Holy Spirit, the energizing presence. Now remember Revelation 5, verse 6, there was a lamb as it had been slain. It had seven horns and seven eyes, which are... Okay, now, if I was going to say, I have two kids, which are... I would be telling you either where they are, who they are, how old they are. I'd be telling you something about them, right? The seven horns and seven eyes, which are, now we're going to learn about them. What are they? The seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. Understand this verse. Who is the lamb? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the one that had these seven horns and seven eyes, correct? Jesus Christ is the one that had these seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, correct? Jesus Christ is the one that had the seven horns and the seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God that were sent forth into all the earth, right? So now go backwards. The seven spirits that were sent forth were the seven eyes and the seven horns, which were upon the Lamb. Where did the Spirit come from? From the Lamb. Where did the Son get the Spirit? From His Father. That's right. And so what you can see in this verse is that the gift at Pentecost was the gift of God's Holy Spirit through the mediation of His Son. Jesus is seeking to impress upon them the thought that in giving His Holy Spirit... He is giving to them the glory which the Father has given him. And he and his people may be one in God. That's one in spirit, by the way. That one Holy Spirit. So that's amazing to me. 
that Jesus gives us the Holy Spirit, which is the same glory that the Father had given to him. You remember John chapter 17, where it says, um, let me see, I'll just find it real quick. John 17, verse 5, I believe it is. Now, Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. What is Christ praying for? He's praying for the Spirit. The glory. And what did Ellen White say? We can have that same glory which the Father had given him. That's the Spirit of the Father. Through the mediation of his Son. Because there's only one mediator between God and men. The man Christ Jesus. John 17 verse 23. I, Christ said, in them, the disciples, and you, Father, in me. Okay, wait a minute. If I am in them, but it's he that is in me, that means we partake of the Father's Spirit. You with me? What it didn't say is you in them. He didn't say that. Because we must understand that we receive the Father's Spirit through the mediation of the Son. Or else we wouldn't have the Holy Spirit to begin with. Because we've chosen in Adam another spirit. But guess what? As soon as there was a sinner... There was what? A savior. So we're not left with the condemnation that Adam had. We're given an opportunity for the probation of life in the second Adam. And as soon as Adam, the first Adam, sinned, there was gifted unto him the promise of a second Adam. And that's why we could continue living with this probationary experience to either choose between good and evil or evil and good. And so, if you want a phrase to look up in the writings of Ellen White, she says, we are probationers. Interesting, I just looked it up last night. I woke up at about, what was it, 3 o'clock in the morning. And because I, I was sleeping last night in the middle of my day, right? So it, it's kind of hard, you know how it is, to, to get used to the time zone. But I woke up at 3 and I started reading in the writings of Ellen White. And I saw the word probationers. I thought, whoa, that's interesting. So I looked up that word. We have been given life on this earth because of the promise of Christ after Adam sinned. And we, since then, are probationers, every one of us, to choose between good or evil. I want to choose good. What about you? Amen. And I want the Spirit of Christ in me to make that happen. Amen? Amen. So I in them and thou in me, that they may be perfect in one, one Spirit, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Again, that's the same verse where the seven eyes, the seven spirit, that's how we get the spirit is through the son and it's the father's spirit. So that's what that's there for. When he had said this, Christ breathed on them and said unto them, receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. The Holy Spirit was not yet fully manifested for Christ had not yet been glorified. The more abundant impartation of the Spirit did not take place till after Christ's ascension. Not until this was received could the disciples fulfill the commission to preach the gospel to the world. But the Spirit was now given for a special purpose. Before the disciples could fulfill their official duties in connection with the church, Christ breathed His Spirit upon them. I'm pretty sure... We're going to be looking at John 7 pretty soon because that was just quoted in there. Christ ascended on high to take his position as our advocate in the heavenly courts. Having reached his throne, he sent his Holy Spirit as he had promised in response to the prayers of his disciples. Acts 2.33 Therefore, being at the right hand of God exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he, Christ, had shed forth this Holy Spirit, which you now see and hear. So even Peter understood what had happened. The Father exalted the Son. The Son was able to give the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit was given from the Father to the Son. You see how that works? Ephesians 4, 5 and 6, there's one Lord. We read that earlier, one Spirit. And then it says there, actually, I didn't read that one. one yeah, I did. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all, through all, and in you all. 
John 17, 23, I and them, thou and me, that the world may be perfect in one. We had kind of read those earlier. When the Holy Spirit was poured out upon the early church, the whole multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. That's the Holy Spirit, one heart and one soul. The Spirit of Christ made them one. This is the fruit of Christ, or abiding rather, in Christ. I will pour out water upon him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit upon your seed or children and my blessing upon thine offspring. So this is the Old Testament prophesying the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The promise of the Holy Spirit was not limited to any age or race. Christ declared that the divine influence of his spirit was to be with his followers unto the end. From the day of Pentecost to the present time, the Comforter has been sent to all who have yielded themselves fully to the Lord and to his service. So from what day? From the day of Pentecost. And that's what's so important about Revelation chapter 5, verse 6, where the seven angels, I'm sorry, the, uh, the seven horns and the seven eyes, which are the seven spirits, are sent forth. That was on the day of Pentecost, same time. In Christ was life, and the life was the light of men. Does the Bible say that Christ was life? No, it says, in him was life, right? And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. But as many as you have received him, to them he gave the power, the Holy Spirit, to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Christ came to our world, but the world could not endure his purity. He has gone to his Father, but he has sent his Holy Spirit to represent him in the world till he shall come again. Christ has left his Holy Spirit to be his representative in the world, to give celestial aid to every hungering, thirsting soul. The Holy Spirit is, Christ, is the Spirit of Christ. It is his representative. He is the, uh, here is the divine agency that carries conviction to the hearts. When the power of his Spirit is revealed through the servants of God, we behold divinity flashing through humanity. Wow. So the power of the Holy Spirit is revealed through you, the servants of God. And that's when we behold divinity flashing through humanity. So the Holy Spirit is the divinity of God. That's how we partake of the divine nature, by partaking of His Spirit. Cumbered with humanity, Christ could not be in every place personally. Therefore, it was altogether for their advantage that he should leave them, go to his Father, and send the Holy Spirit to be his successor on the earth. The Holy Spirit is Christ, or the Holy Spirit is himself, divested of the personality of humanity and independent thereof. He, Christ, would represent himself as present in all places by his Holy Spirit, as the omnipresent. So I think that's really important to understand. So, he was divested of the personality of humanity. Who is the one that partook of the personality of humanity? It was Christ. It was not the Father, and it wasn't the third being of the Trinity. So, obviously, the one that was divested of the personality of humanity is Christ. And it's Christ's omnipresence as represented here. He would represent himself as every place, as the omnipresent present in, every, in all places, rather, by his Holy Spirit as the omnipresent. John 16, 7, I tell you the truth, it is expedient that, to you that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. You know what this is saying? If Christ stayed on the earth, the Holy Ghost wouldn't be able to come. But when Christ leaves, the Holy Spirit will be able to come. As a Trinitarian pastor, that was very difficult for me to try to think through. Why was it that Christ would not be able to be here along with the Comforter? What's, what's the deal? He had to leave, and then the Comforter would come. Why? Because when he was accepted by the Father, then the Comforter, the gift of that Son, who perfected righteousness in humanity, he would be sent, that Spirit. Corinthians 12, verse 9, he said, unto you, he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for you. My strength, my grace, my spirit, is made perfect in weakness. Christ gave his spirit as a divine power in 1908. 
Uh, sorry, rather, that was The Desire of Ages and in the uh, Review and Herald. So it had been written earlier than that. They have one God and one Savior and one Spirit. The Spirit of Christ is to bring unity into their ranks. So again, that Spirit is the Spirit of Christ. Ephesians 4, 3 through 6. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit of the bond in peace. We've already read this one, so I'm going to skip it. There's one Spirit, one God, one Father, one Lord. Sin could be resisted and overcome only through the mighty, mighty agency of the third person, or the Spirit of Christ, of the Godhead. Christ has given His Spirit, it says in that same paragraph, as a divine power to overcome all hereditary and cultivated tendencies to evil, and to impress His own character upon His church. So what's amazing about this paragraph is many people will use this one portion at the top, sin could be resisted and overcome only through the mighty, mighty agency of the third person of the Godhead. And the new books will capitalize third person. Whereas I have an original Desire of Ages from 1898, and when you go to this page, 671.2, it does not have capitalized letters in the third person idea. And so the church and the publishers have helped it be easier to understand that the third person is a title for a being. Okay? But it's not. The third person is, I've got a lot to say about that, by the way, this, that third person idea is a huge study, but it all makes sense. It's all make perfect sense. So if you read those quotes about the third person of the Godhead, please continue to study and you'll find that there are answers and it's all consistent with what we've been reading so far. There is no power in you apart from Christ, but it is your privilege to have Christ abiding in your heart by faith and he can overcome sin in you when you cooperate with his efforts. Who overcomes sin in you? Christ does it. With his spirit, Christ sends a reconciling influence and a power that takes away sin. Amazing. The prince of the power of the air can only be held in check by the power of God in the third person, which is the spirit of Christ, of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. And we know that she said that even in the Desire of Ages, that the indwelling Christ is what helps you overcome sin. Jesus alone has power to save from sin, to free from the power of evil, and to doubt him who has laid down his life for us is to grieve and insult who? The Father. So what is grieving the Spirit? It's to doubt him who has laid his life down for us. Jesus alone has the power to save from sin. The only, this is the one I was referring to in Desire of Ages, the only defense against evil is the indwelling of Christ in the heart through faith in his righteousness. The indwelling of the Spirit? Yes, but it's the Spirit of Christ. Extremely important to understand. John 7 through 13, I'm going to skip this part because I can do that later. But it's very important to understand that the representative that Christ gave... Oh, here's that quote that I was reading from Manuscript 44. I will read that, actually. This one's really important. Whoops, I'm going the wrong way. Here it is. Christ determined to bestow a gift on those who had been with him and on those who should believe on him. Because this was the occasion of his ascension and inauguration, a jubilee in heaven. What gift could Christ bestow rich enough to signalize and grace his ascension to the mediatorial throne? It must be worthy of his greatness and his royalty. Notice this next sentence. Christ gave his representative, the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. This gift could not be excelled. The divine person, I'm sorry, the divine spirit, converting, enlightening, sanctifying, would be his donation because he would give all gifts in one. So according to this quote, we must understand Ellen White knew and understood that the third person or the representative was the Holy Spirit, which was the gift and donation of Christ, which was his spirit. So every time you read the third person idea, you must understand it was referring to the spirit of Christ every single time. And according to Revelation 5, verse 6, where the lamb, which had the seven horns and seven eyes, 
sent forth the Spirit. We know that according to the Bible. Remember the words of Christ. Remember that He, Christ, is an unseen presence in the person of the Holy Spirit. Praise God. Amen. I am with you always, even at the end of the world. We want the Holy Spirit, which is Jesus Christ, according to letter 66. He hath said, I will never leave you, nor forsake you, according to Hebrews. Lift up Christ in His power, in the person of the Holy Spirit. Now, Revelation 3, verse 20, which is the very close of the Laodicean message, what we learn is, Christ says this, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. So Christ is the one knocking. What does He want to do? If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and sup with him and he with me. So what could be more startling to the Seventh-day Adventist church than the message teaching that they are Laodicean and Christ is outside of that church? So if you've been kicked out of the church, you're in the same area Christ is. Yes. Isn't that amazing? It is said. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If he was inside the door, he wouldn't be knocking to get out. He's knocking to come in. The Spirit of Christ is not in the church. Why? Because they have accepted the Trinity and have rejected him. That's exactly why. We want the Holy Spirit, which is Jesus Christ. Christ walks unseen through our streets. That's a ministry of healing. Here, this is a um, 14 manuscript. How few realize that Jesus, unseen, is walking by their side. How ashamed many would be to hear his voice speaking to them and to know how he heard all their foolish common talk. So Jesus is the one that's unseen walking by their side, right? Remember that Jesus is beside you wherever you go, noting your actions and listening to your words. So these are all written that, uh, that Ellen White had, had penned down in published writings. The human agent, the seen instrument, is to preach the word. And the Lord Jesus, the unseen agency, by his Holy Spirit, is to make the word efficacious and powerful. He, Christ, is an unseen presence in the person of the Holy Spirit. One year before the Desire of Ages was published. Now, we need to realize that the Holy Spirit, remember Christ by His Spirit, who is as much a person as God is a person, is walking through these grounds. Unseen by human eyes, He hears every word we utter and knows every thought of the mind. Now, so, so many people have problems with a stenographer's letters when they don't go and research what she meant by unseen. Who, according to the previous words, were unseen walking amongst us? It's Christ Jesus that's unseen walking amongst us. And so, in a sermon at Avondale School in Australia, she said this, and everybody brings this one up, no, 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 no. The Holy Spirit is just as much a person as God is a person. Well, yeah, the Spirit of Christ, His Son. That makes perfect sense, and that's exactly what she meant when she was writing these things. So, I'm finished with the presentation. Thank you so much for your patience. I know it has been long, but I believe we've been able to understand a little bit better what the Bible and Ellen White meant when they talked about the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, the Representative, the Third Person. It refers to the Spirit of who? Christ. Christ. And so I want to surrender myself to Christ, asking for Him to be able to lead me into life eternal. Because I want to accept his words just as they read. What about you? Yes. Amen. Let's pray real quick, and then if there are any questions, we'll take a few. <coughs> Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us the time where we could look at these quotes from the pen of your messenger, and also that we can look at the Bible verses that we saw. There were some that were mentioned twice or three times, but there was a lot of information that we covered just now. I pray that you'd help us to be able to see and understand what it is that your spirit is saying to the churches. We pray that you'd help us to hear the voice of him that is knocking on our door, the door of our hearts, and we'll be able to open the door and have your son come in and sup with us. 
We pray you would be glorified in our lives, that you'll be able to use us to share with others what it is that you are teaching about who the Holy Spirit is and what it represents. Thank you so much that we can have this time together and pray that as we continue on with a few questions, you will bless us. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.